People need to know about a species in order to act on behalf of that species and protect their habitat. Polar Bears International is uniquely poised to connect people to polar bears in the Arctic. The Tender Connections program allows us to connect scientists with viewers around the globe. And the goal of outreach like this is to instill hope and inspire action in our viewers. We have a mobile broadcast studio, and we reach out to classrooms all over the world to talk about polar bears in the western Hudson Bay. We have a couple different kinds of connections that we do out here. Sometimes it's live back and forth, and other times the live connection goes out and questions are chatted back for us to answer. Will polar bears go extinct? What can my class do to help protect sea ice? Just the other day, we had a Skype chat with an entire school in Kiev, and we got to show them their very first polar bear. And, and when that comes up on the screen, it's really cool. It's neat to maybe inspire the next generation of scientists. Seeing their faces light up when we show them videos and photos and talk about our research gives us motivation to keep going and keep doing what we're doing. Join us as we stream live. You can view the broadcast on our website or watch live chats on social media. Tune in, ask questions, join our efforts to protect polar bears and the sea ice they depend on. Hello and welcome to Polar Bears International Spring Tundra Connection Series. My name is BJ Kirschhofer and I'm the Director of Field Operations for Polar Bears International. We don't usually offer Tundra Connections in the spring, but we figured now, more than ever, our community could use a fresh opportunity for virtual learning and Arctic inspiration. So for the months of April and May, we're broadcasting live from our homes across the globe with content catered to kids, but anybody is welcome to, to participate. Today's webcast is called Purple Hair on Polar Bears. What does that mean? I thought polar bears were white. Well, stay tuned to hear more about purple polar bears. Our partner on today's program is explore.org. Our audience is, uh, or this, our target audience today is secondary school students, but anybody is welcome to join. Should last about 30 minutes a day and will include time for question and answers. So during the broadcast, if you have a question, please feel free to submit your questions in the chat window down below, or you can send them to questions at pbears.org. So I'm not alone today. I've got two special guests with me. First, I'd like to start with Jenny. Jenny, would you introduce yourself? Hi, my name is Jenny Stern. I'm a graduate student at the University of Washington in Dr. Kristen Lydra's lab, and I study polar bears. Great, and we also have Jeff. Hi, my name is Jeff York. I'm the Senior Director of Conservation at Polar Bears International. I've been working in the Arctic for almost 27 years now and on polar bears specifically for 21. So before we get into purple polar bears, I want to talk a little bit about uh, how we know what we know about polar bears. And um, if you wanted to learn about an animal, you might want to observe that animal, right, Jeff? You'd want to maybe watch and see what that animal does. Absolutely. But like you and I know, polar bears live in really remote parts of our planet, places that are hard to get to, super cold and super dark for parts of the year. So it makes it kind of tough just to watch them. So I couldn't just stand on the beach, maybe in Churchill year round with, uh, with, pair of binoculars and make notes on polar bears because they wouldn't be there, would they? They wouldn't. So even in places like Southern Hudson Bay, Western Hudson Bay, where polar bears come on shore seasonally, they also go out on the ice for the rest of the year. So for polar bears, being out on sea ice is where they prefer to be. They only come ashore in places where that ice melts out significantly and they have no other choice. So unless you're willing to go out on the ice with them, which is pretty difficult, there have to be other ways to, to track and follow them. So this is kind of where technology has come in, and it's been an evolution to help us understand more about polar bears, right? So we actually fit uh, polar bears with collars that tell us where they are? 
Absolutely. So this goes back to work originally done here in Montana by the Craigheads in Yellowstone National Park on grizzly bears and trying to figure out Oop, we might have lost Jeff's audio there. Yeah, I think he froze up, but he'll probably come back. Okay. I think what Jeff was going to say, though, is this is a this is an example of a radio caller here. And here in Yellowstone National Park, this is where some of the earliest bears, not polar bears, but of course grizzly bears, were fitted with radio collars. Um, and uh, so that scientists could understand where the bears are and where they go. So work started there in uh, here in, in Yellowstone. Actually, it's not far from where I am right now and where, where Jeff is um, here in Bozeman, Montana. Um, of course, uh, scientists then said, well, if we can do this with grizzly bears, why don't we try it with polar bears too? So you're looking here, this is a picture of Dr. Steve Amstrip um, working with radio collars north of Alaska, where he was putting or collars on polar bears so he could understand where they went. Now, the early days of radio collars, uh, these were just VHF collars. And what that means is that polar bear or the collar itself was almost like a radio station. And scientists had to fly around in the Arctic uh, with airplanes to figure out where these bears were. They'd fly, physically fly over them and try to beep them out. Jeff, are we back? I think so. We'll see what technology does for us. Yeah, right. Well, we can find where polar bears are. Do we know where you are? Um, <laughs> but so I was just saying a little bit about how VHF color was almost like a radio station and scientists would have to fly over the sea ice in airplanes to try to find where these bears were. And then you'd, would you mark them on a map? Yeah, we'd have to fly in small aircraft for days to go out and cover the huge area the polar bears could possibly be. And you do what are called sort of box turns. So you'd fly along, you'd hear a faint signal, and when it became strong and then started to go faint again, you'd turn right. And you would just keep doing it over and over and over again as you tuned into different frequencies and flew across the north slope of Alaska in our case and out on the sea ice. So it was very labor intensive because you were in a small aircraft for a long period of time. It also has its own risk, um, especially considering what was underneath you when you were flying out over the ice or, you know, in pretty remote parts of the Arctic there. So very, very manual, very labor intensive. And I think you probably said too, like from the early days to up through now, we could only follow the movements of females because we can't put collars on adult males. Wow, so we really only knew where the where the ladies were going. So uh, scientists don't just fly over the, the sea ice anymore looking for, for beeps or listening for pings from polar bear radio stations that they're wearing on their neck. How does it work now? Yeah, so I feel lucky. Like during my career, I came in right at the end of traditional VHF radio tracking, which was super fun to do if you like to fly, and I do. It was a great chance to be out in the field at unusual times of the year. But we switched quickly to satellite methodologies, and the first one was one called Argos. It was an array of satellites that was already being used for other purposes, and it gave us pretty good information um, remotely. Depended on, on the transmission and the caller sometimes, but it was you know way easier than radio tracking. And within a matter of years, Argos moved on to what we know today as GPS collars. And those give us extremely accurate locations. And an example now, if we have a collar drop off and we go out to pick it up, we land on the collar. There's no looking around you know, where it might be. You go right to the exact spot where the collar is. So they're extremely accurate. And they give us uh, really good location information and can transmit other things too. So you could put different sensors on those collars uh, to maybe tell what's happening, what the bear might be doing at that particular time, as well as the information of where the bear is at that time, right? That's right. A, a good way to think of it is like our phones, our smartphones, is you're basically adding apps in a sense. You're adding different tools that might tell you is a bear in salt water, is it swimming? Is it diving and how deep? Um, what 
the temperature is of where the bear's at, what's the ambient temperature, things like that. But just like our smartphones, the more of that stuff you add, the more battery you need or the quicker your battery dies. So it's a real balancing act when the most important information is that location information. And so we, we've kind of drawn back on some of those bells and whistles to make sure we're getting really good uh, battery life and really good location information. So if I were to put on this polar bear collar right now, and it could tell what I was doing in my house in my very small environment here. So maybe uh, the accelerometer of this collar would see that I was typing on my keyboard when I'm in my little office. It might see that I was eating when I was in the kitchen and the water sensor might say, well, he's taking a bath when he's in, in the bathroom. And maybe each of these areas would be separated you know, from my different behaviors. Is that kind of what we're doing with polar bears? That's one of the things we're interested in. And it's been a neat area of kind of captive and wild collaboration is trying to figure out what that accelerometer data means. Um, we've had that sensor on collars for a while, but we weren't able to interpret the numbers it was giving us very well. But through putting it on bears in captivity, filming them, watching them, observing them in person, we can now have a better idea. Are they rolling around? Are they running, walking, swimming? You might see a hunting event where a bear is going really slow and then suddenly accelerates and then basically stay still again. So we can start to interpret some of this, you know, accelerometer data, which helps us say a little bit more about not only where bears are out on the ice, but what they might be doing. Well, I think if you looked at my collar data from today, you'd see that making repeated trips to the refrigerator. Uh, I've had breakfast twice. Anyway, so let's move on to uh, Jenny here. Whoops, we just camera. Uh, Jenny, maybe you could talk a little bit about your research because you're using some of the data from the collar, but other stuff too, right? Where where are you? Yeah. Working? Um, so the, the population of polar bears that I work with is a shared population between Greenland and Canada. They're called the Baffin Bay population. And so what you're seeing on the screen right now are um, all of the bears that my advisor um, captured in the helicopter. Those are all those red dots. And you can see um, the Baffin Bay population of the 19 subpopulations is highlighted in red. Um, and so these are the bears that I study. and um, my main goal is to figure out what they're eating and, and kind of what they're doing a lot, like what you talked about with the collars. Mm, so, um, so you're trying to figure out what they eat. I thought polar bears just ate seals. Could they be maybe eating some other things out there too? Yeah, so, so um, bears that go across the pack ice, which is what um, track line we're seeing now, have the opportunity to eat lots of different animals as they go across the sea ice. Seals are still their favorite um, food to eat, but they also can eat narwhals, belugas, um, walruses. And so there are some other dietary items, maybe um, some terrestrial food sources in, in Baffin Bay, but not enough to, to sustain them. So, so we're basically trying to figure out if they're only eating seals or if they're using some of these alternate prey sources. But there's no, uh, there's no seal sensor on this collar here, is there? How do you know what the polar bear captured when it's way out there in the sea ice with only just this? Or do you have some other information too? You're exactly right. Um, so we actually use their hair. Um, polar bear hair and even human hair or um, cat hair can show you what an animal has been eating because um, everything that we eat has a certain chemical signature and we use that food to build tissues in our body, hair included. And so um, as the bear is eating, that gets incorporated in that hair and we can use chemistry back in the lab to try to reconstruct kind of signals of, of what they were eating or, or even where they were eating. So I've got a flood of questions in my mind. If you have any questions as you're watching this, be sure to email us questions at pbears.org or enter them into the chat. We'll get to those here shortly. Um, but so so how do you how do you collect polar bear hair?
from the wild polar bears? Um, so basically, there's a, a team of scientists that fly around in a helicopter and they, um, when they dart the bear to be able to put on the satellite collar, um, they collect a suite of samples. So they're going to be collecting fat, hair, um, you know, maybe a little bit of a claw, a vestigial tooth, so a tooth that the bear doesn't use at all. Um, they'll tattoo the inside of its lip. So if it gets captured again, we know that it's been captured before. And so when the bear is getting all of these things collected from it, um, they also take a little bit of hair. Um, in Greenland, they take it from the rump. So kind of near the, the back of the polar bear. And, and those are the hair samples that I use. So do you need a lot of hair to, to do what you're doing? I mean, do you have to take a whole bunch or is it just, just a few strands? Um, so uh, you don't actually need that much. It's, we can fit how much hair we need in like a tiny little tin capsule, but you'll notice that the, there's a pretty good amount of hair being collected. As you can see in these bags, these are bags of hair from bears in Greenland. Um, we just want to make sure we have enough and we want it to be representative of all the hair. So we think that there might be a little bit of variation in where, when that hair is growing. So we want a nice kind of small chunk so we can can average over over all the hairs that were collected so before we get any further here we've got two questions that have come in that are pretty related one of them is from sally edwards um and she's asking do the collars automatically fall off um and jeff maybe you could answer that uh, how, how do polar bears take off their collar? And that's how what Emanuela from Romania is asking. Do, you know, how do you get these collars off? Sure. So a couple of things on that. When biologists started putting collars on bears broadly, the only way you got them off was if you caught the bear again and took it off. Um, when we started collaring polar bears in Alaska, we were very careful to measure the necks and then to put the collar on over the bear's head. So we would slide it on like BJ did earlier with the collar he has there. And what that does is it allows the female the option of sliding it off. Most didn't, most wore, wore, you know, would wear them without any problem, much like our dogs wear collars. But every now and then there would be a female that didn't want anything to do with the collar and she would just, what we call shuck it. She would just pull it off. We'd go back out and find it on the ice and then find another bear to wear that collar. Um, nowadays, and you can see in that last image, there's a little brown box on the side. And most researchers are actually putting out two of these per collar. And these are automatic release mechanisms. They have a little clock inside of them, a little mini computer. They're battery powered and you basically just set a date like you would set your alarm clock. And that's when a little mechanism will trigger and the collar will be able to drop off the bear. We try to drop it off um, or set those drop off times when bears are closer to shore or onshore. So we have a better chance of recovering them because those collars cost about 5,000 US dollars. And if we can refurbish them, we can save several thousand. So it's much cheaper to refurbish collars. And then there's also a bunch of data that's stored on the collar itself. It's not transmitted by satellite because it would just cost too much battery to do that. So when we get those collars back, we get a lot more data from those bears. Way cool. Thanks, Jeff. I want to bring it back over to you, Jenny. Um, so you were talking a little bit about uh, taking polar bear hair and being able to see what it was eating. Um, so this is from wild bears, but uh, are you also working with bears in captivity too? Are you working with some bears in zoos? Yeah, um, so much like Jeff was saying, there's just some things that we have a lot of trouble finding out in the wild because these bears are really inaccessible and live in really remote places. And so a big question that polar bear re researchers have now is when does the hair grow? How long does it take for the hair to grow? Um, and this is really important information because when we, when we take that hair and we figure out what the bear has been eating, we want to be able to match it with the time um, when that bear was eating. So if the bear is eating a lot in the, you know, spring and then the hair is growing in the spring, we know that that hair represents the spring. So I've been working with zoos to 
figure out what time window um, the hair is growing. So, so this is a bear in San Diego, um, and she has a big purple dye spot um, that helps us measure how fast the hair is growing. Um, we so do that this a lot. So that spot on her rump there is uh, that's purple dye on her fur. Yeah, just it's human hair dye. Just if you decided that you wanted to dye your hair purple, you would buy the same stuff. Um, and if you did dye your hair purple and um, let it grow out and maybe couldn't get it re-dyed because you were, say, in quarantine or something, um, your roots would start to show. And that's part of the way that we measure how fast the hair is growing is we look at how fast and how much of the roots are showing on these, these dye patches on the captive polar bears. Wow. So this kind of looks like peanut butter in a tube. Is that peanut butter? <laughs> That's hair dye. Um, it doesn't look purple here, but that's um, kind of what it looks like as we apply it. It has some um, anti-graying drops put in there just because polar bear hair is transparent. So we want to give it the, the biggest chance it can to stick to that hair and really do a nice dye job so we can we can measure the roots that are showing. So this is um, that was a picture of a, a zookeeper, Cindy, at Point Defiant Zoo and Aquarium, and she um, was getting ready to to apply the dye to to Blizzard the polar bear who is fully awake during this process. So it takes a lot of skill to be able to um, dye a polar bear's hair while it's awake. Yeah, and some bravery, I would think. I mean, what if it doesn't <laughs> like that purple color? You know, we don't consult them about the color, but um, maybe we should. Well, that's great. That's so cool. So whose hair grows faster, humans or polar bears? That's a good question. I, uh -oh, I would say I that human you. hair probably grows faster, but um, to be determined. So are you able then to tell what the zoo bear is eating by looking at its hair? Um. That's not really something we look at. We could, but um, we usually know what the zoo bear is eating. And so um, basically we do the same process that we do with wild animals, um, but we give them a very special snack that is a labeled isotope. And so it's this pill that the bears will eat. It's completely safe to eat. Um, humans could take one of these, no problem. And basically it will show up as um kind of like a, a spike on the graph. And so we know when we gave them that pill and then we can see when it shows up in the hair. So we, um, you know, we, we aren't looking whether they change the diets from one kind of meat to another, but we do really want to know when this pill is showing up in the hair. So I've got some polar bear hair in front of me here. So if you, uh, at some point in the bear's life, fed it that pill, then uh, then that would show up somewhere in this almost like a column of fur. You'd be able to be able to see that that pill when it was fed. Yeah, so basically it would have to be fed in the past year. Polar bears do molt every single year and, and shed. And so um, the pill would have to be fed during a time of active hair growth. And when we if I was to pluck some of that hair, I would section it into little pieces. And I would look what section has the, the pill signal showing up in it. And that's another way that we measure hair growth. So we kind of have two methods. We can look at it visually with the hair dye, and then we have this kind of chemical approach that um, uses some of the same methods that we do with wild bears. So how do you, how do you get a polar bear to eat a little pill like that? Um, as the zookeepers repeatedly tell me, that's the easy part. So the, the dye is the hard part, but um, they just hide the pill in, in a special snack, um, sometimes marshmallow, sometimes some a meatball, and, and the bears just eat it right up. But um, yeah, the getting them to stay still for the hair dye is, is the harder part. That's funny. I think uh, meatballs and marshmallows are probably two of my favorite foods. <laughs> Very cool. So let's see. Um, you know, so I think I want to talk a little bit transferring back here to you, Jeff. These these collars are pretty big. Um, 
and my cell phone is pretty small. Uh, has there been advancements recently in transmitters uh, that maybe polar bears could wear uh, that might help Ab shrink down the technology a little bit? Absolutely. Unfortunately, in wildlife science, we're kind of the last to get the latest technology trickles down pretty slowly because there's just not a lot of money to be made uh, for folks selling this stuff. But we are getting smaller and smaller devices. A lot of the work has been led by marine, other marine mammal scientists, so people studying smaller marine mammal seals in particular. But then really good work has been led by folks studying seabirds and waterfowl, you know, because they need to also follow these migratory birds that travel long distances so there's no way they're using a big collar and they've really led to the miniaturization of some of these tags so on polar bears now we have a pretty decent argos satellite tag that we can put on their ear it still requires us to poke a hole in the ear to put the tag on and there's no easy way for the tag to come off unless we catch that bear again so it's small uh, but it's not quite what we want yet. So we are looking at some other options. And this, we brought, we asked Jenny for some help on this too, right? Maybe we'll get into that here in a second. But um, if this thing uh, uh, gets attached to the ear, there might be some better ways to attach this to a polar bear, right? Absolutely. And this is where kind of those, the, the two threads join together. One thing we would love to be able to do is to just attach the tag to polar bear fur. And we've tried for years different ways of kind of gluing those small tags. Bear, we've had trouble with the antennas, we've had trouble with the adhesives, uh, putting them someplace where a bear might just pull it off. So there have been lots of challenges. And then when you think too about where polar bears live and how they live, they're in and out of seawater, it's freezing. Um, it's really difficult on any kind of technology or any kind of attachment method. And so in looking at, can we put something on hair too? It's good for us to know, well, how quickly is hair growing? Because what one often does is you would shave down an area and just have really fine hair or possibly no hair and try to you know, connect something directly to the skin there. But if that hair is growing, in a matter of months and making that attachment unstable, that's not going to work very well. So we finally reached out to a company that is world renowned for sticking things to other things, whether that be adhesives, whether that be sticky notes. Um, we reached out to 3M because we figured they're the experts on making things stick. And we've been working with them now for about a year, a little bit more. And they actually had an internal contest among engineering groups in, in their company, which is a pretty big company, to see who had the best ideas for how we might attach something to polar bear hair. And so far, they're coming up with some pretty cool thoughts and blending both a medical grade adhesive. So if you think about some of the things that we have done to ourselves. Like if you go to the dentist and get a crown on your tooth, they glue the tooth in, in your mouth. And it's often with 3M products that that's done. So we have medical grade adhesives that are safe for humans. And we're looking at you know, how those might polar bear. But we're also looking at physical attachment methods and an idea that seems to be leading the way. And if any of you have dogs or cats that go outside, you'll know this one is think of how a burr gets in your dog's fur and how hard it is to get out. And that's kind of the direction 3M engineers went. So it'll be exciting to see, hopefully yet this year, what comes out of that. We're working hopefully soon with um, a few zoos that'll help us as well. Just like Jenny is working with the zoo community and the bears in the zoo to test some of her theories. So um, we're hoping to do the same uh, with some zoos. Point Defiance Zoo and Aquarium is one of them that we're looking at working with and Kansas City Zoo as well. And uh, many other institutions are interested in this, which is very cool because you know, some of these bears that are in these zoos could help us understand uh, what 
and how best to do this stuff uh, when we actually get to the wild bears before we even get there. So pretty neat. So Jenny, we reached out to you on this, uh, jokingly, we call it the Burr on Fur Project. Uh, this Burr on Fur Project, um, just so we could understand a little bit more about polar bear fur, is that right? Yeah, um, it's it's a great idea to be able to, to attach this tag to the fur um, and something that we kind of I was brought in to to share with the competition when people were designing these is you do have to factor in that that polar bears do lose their hair and grow a new coat every single year. And so if it's if it's attached to that fur kind of um, realizing that, you know, that that tag could probably only last one year at its maximum. Hmm. So Jenny, and Emma from Winnipeg cool wondering. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, Jeff. Oh, a couple of cool things on the tag, too is one and this was true for collar development is if you can get something to work in the arctic on a polar bear it's going to be able to work well on a lot of other things too other species in other places but the other part for us specifically with polar bears is if we can perfect this method and get some decent longevity by putting a tag on polar bear fur we can start to track males sub-adults and maybe even cubs if we have small enough tag by just being able to do a quick attachment. And it's possible down the road, we might be able to do something remotely um, as this technology develops. So it opens up a lot of cool possibilities. Yeah, so I think you briefly mentioned earlier, Jeff, that right now only female polar bears wear collars. And so we don't, I mean, we have a pretty good idea what the males are doing, but we don't really have location information quite like we do for for the females. So it'll be neat to see what potentially these males are doing. And like you said, the sub adults as well. Um, there's a question from Emma in Winnipeg here, Jenny, how many bears are you following in your study? How many wild bears? Oh, wild bears. There's, um, there's 138. And so I have 138 hair samples. Um, for the, the bears that we're actually following with the satellite collars, like like we've said a couple of times, those can only be the females. And there's about um, like a little over 40 females that we have that location information for. Um, so, but it's a, it's an interesting Jeff, project too, because we, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Nope. I want to hear your thoughts here. Oh, we have, um, we have all age classes. And so, so sometimes with polar bears, we can only get samples from those that are, that are hunted. And so we never get um, information from cubs um, and uh, in this project we have captured polar bears that are you know cubs of the year yearlings or two-year-olds too hmm. jeff uh, emanuela again from romania is wondering how many bears exist total worldwide do we know that we have an estimation for that but it is very much an estimation because our population data is sparse it's not evenly distributed around the arctic um, different countries have been more or less able to go out and do the kinds of studies um, to estimate populations let alone do them multiple times over multiple years and so we have to kind of crib together different types of information different types of survey information and from different time frames but it gives us an estimate very broadly of around 23,000 bears to 26,000 bears uh, globally. Um, but again, there are a lot of blank spots on the map. If you go to the polar bear specialist group uh, website or polar bears international website and look at uh, our maps that show which populations have um, estimation data and which don't, you'll see that about half the Arctic is blank and most of that is in the, the Russian Arctic where conditions have just been, you know, too difficult logistically and too expensive uh, to really nail that down. I think this is a good opportunity um, for any young scientists out there thinking that maybe uh, wildlife biology might be something that you would want to get into. We don't know everything we want to know about polar bears. There's still lots to learn about the world around us. And, uh, and I think this is a good example. We don't actually know how many, exactly how many polar bears we think we know. 
but there are probably new methods to be invented uh, to help us count some of these bears remotely or however. So, uh, so study hard in school and, uh, and come help us out in the polar bear world. So I wanna thank Jeff and Jenny today for taking the time to meet with us uh, and webcasting. I wanna thank all of the viewers today for taking the time to, to participate. Thanks for your great questions. Um, and uh, if you're a student or an adult charged with uh, online learning at your home, the Polar Bears International uh, website has a great education center. Um, please visit that. There's um, all kinds of great lesson plans on there for you. And uh, we definitely want to reach out and say thanks to the Arctic Ambassador Centers um, for Polar Bears International that are helping us with both Jenny's study and the other studies, potentially these um, this Burr on Fur project and everything else we do helping support our, our work. So thank you to the Polar Bears International AACs. And of course, our partner, explore.org. Um, they uh, help us broadcast here. Um, if you're looking for a little diversity in your day, definitely jump onto the Explore site. There are, I checked this morning, there's 99 live streaming cameras on species all over the world. It's a great place to kind of cruise around and uh and maybe see something new so thanks everybody we will be back on thursday please join us again and see you later